Welcome to Mormon Book Reviews, where an evangelical encounters the Restoration. I am your host, Stephen Pettiger, and look who's back for another segment of Obscure Mormon Doctrine, where I don't know what he's going to talk about, just like we do with Brent Ashworth with his show and tell. I don't know, but it's going to be something based on his book, Obscure Mormon Doctrine, Uncommon Beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Chris Jensen, welcome to the program today. Thank you, Stephen. Great to be back, so, and, and, and unexpectedly quickly, yes. which, is, which is good. Yes, yes. Anytime an author has a chance to get in front of the camera to to promote his book, he's going to jump right on yeah, that. I know that. I, I better, I better, better take it while I can get it right. Exactly, exactly. So, uh, so yeah, good to good to see you again. Yeah, same here, same here. Um, so, what do you have for t for us today? Well, it doesn't sound that sexy. Um, it's Christ. OK, but um, I think it's going to be interesting. You know, uh, there's a reason why I chose the the, the topic and you'll see why. Um, and so we're going to talk about Christ. and We're, we're going to talk about the unique view of Christ in many respects that, that the LDS Church takes. Excellent. And um, as we have mentioned or you have mentioned in previous um, interviews with me, the book is structured alphabetically according to topic and and so chapter 15 is christ and um i'll just you know make it relatively quick and and then if you want to you know jump in whenever you whenever you have something to say go ahead but you know the first thing is obviously the church is christian despite what some people would say you know um and the official name of the church is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. But um, the first thing that's interesting about the, the LDS position is that whereas most Christians believe that, that the God of the Old Testament is, is God the Father, um, in fact, Christ is Jehovah, mm -hmm. the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. And... To be honest, I don't know how many Mormons know that. I mean, to me, that was news. Amazingly, even though even though I grew up in the church, it's just something that never really clicked with me. And so there are really important impl implications of that position. Um, you know, all revelations since the fall of Adam come through Christ, not through God the Father. And you always have this image. I mean, I always, I always had this image, um, you know, if you're watching the Ten Commandments or something, that it's God the Father speaking to Moses, for example, and the LDS position is no, it's Christ. You know, when the scriptures mention God in the Old Testament, it means Christ. Well, and just real quick, I want to just clarify real quick, because there's two names of God in the Old Testament. You have um, Elohim, uh, which, of course, uh, Joseph learned from the uh, Rabbi Sextus uh, in Kirtland, that Elohim is a uh, is a plural, uh, can be used in a plural sense. And then we have yeah. uh, Yahweh or Jehovah. So we have two names of God. So this is where you have the concept of Elohim and you have the concept of Jehovah. So so we so it's almost like talking about two separate entities at times as well in the old in the Hebrew Bible. That's right. And Elohim would be God the Father, and Jehovah would be uh, Christ. Hmm who is the God of the Old Testament, according mm -hmm. to LDS uh, theology. And another really fascinating implication of that position is that the God of Israel um, was Christ. Yeah. <laughs> and so it was Christ who, in fact, led the nation of Israel out of Egyptian bondage and who gave and fulfilled the law of Moses, not God the Father. And that's something that I think a lot of people don't understand with, within the church. Um, another interesting, unique position that the church takes uh, regarding Christ is that he created the earth under the direction of God the Father. So he was actually the, the creator of, of the earth. And not only of this earth, but many, many innumerable earths. And we'll talk about that a little bit later, but that's the that's the plan of salvation. And um, God simply directed 
Christ's creation of this earth, and not only of this earth and other earths, but everything in the earth. Um, with one exception, man. And so Christ created the earth, created animals, plants, you name it, everything that's living. With one big exception, man, who was created by God the Father. Mm. And that's the only thing God created directly in this earth and all of his other earths. Um, another interesting position that the LDS ch church takes is that Christ is the literal son of God, both spiritually and physically. And so that means that he was God's first spirit child um, and God's only physical child. And that's one reason why Jesus and God are virtually identical in appearance. Because he's literally the physical offspring of, of God and spiritual offspring. Yeah, and then we see that in and, the Saint paintings of the first vision. They look very similar to each other. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, um, you know, there's a mis so, so there's a misconce misconception from the LDS perspective there that Christ was begotten or, you know, with, you know, th through his mother, Mary, begotten by the Holy Ghost. And there's an interesting quote that I'm going to take from the book from Brigham Young, where he says, when the time came that God, his firstborn, the Savior, should come into the world and take a tabernacle, meaning a body, the Father, God the Father, came himself and favored, in other words, inseminated that spirit, meaning Mary, with a tabernacle meaning Christ, instead of letting any other man do it. The Savior was begotten by the Father of his Spirit, by the same being who is the Father of our Spirit. And that is all the organic difference between Jesus Christ and you and me. The birth of the Savior was as natural as are the births of our children. It was the result of natural action he was begotten of his father as we were of our fathers. And so it's a much more literal take on, um, you know, the, the, the way Christ was conceived uh, with, with Mary. Um, another interesting point, which is unique, is that uh, as a redeemer, he redeems not only humans, uh, but all living things, mm -hmm. meaning plants, animals, you name it. And so, as any Mormon would know, all living things existed spiritually before they came to earth. And that's a, that's a chapter in the book, chapter 30. The pre-existence and so uh everything everything was was formed spiritually first and then it was given a, a physical uh body and that's true of humans and every living thing and i speculate in the book whether that includes germs uh you know etc no answer to that question but it's an it's an interesting speculation but as it relates to Christ, um, all living things will be resurrected as a result of his atonement, mm -hmm. not just humans. Mm -hmm. And so plants, animals will be resurrected and will be immortal. They will live forever in paradise. And to me, again, you and I have talked many times or a number of times about how logical some of this sounds you know um you mentioned in the previous interview how it's logical to you that eternity is about progressing it's not about sitting around on a, on a cloud playing a harp and i completely agree with you and this is another 
point of doctrine that to me is more logical than typical Christian doctrine. If there's paradise and you're living in it forever, it wouldn't be paradise if there weren't plants and animals, mm -hmm. you know, especially animals, if you're an animal lover like me. Mm -hmm. And so how, how, how do they end up in paradise? Well, they're, um, they're saved through Christ's atonement. You know, it's fascinating <laughs> because, you know, I don't know what topic you're going to talk about before we start recording. And so often with my channel, I focus on so many of the similarities that even that, I, you know, evangelicals have with Mormons and some of the commonalities that I kind of like to discuss. This is an example of Theologically, Mormonism is so outside of Christian orthodoxy in its b beliefs about uh, the, the nature of God. You know, it's fascinating because within our context, you know, when we talk about um, God uh, the, from a, a Christian or a, like even a Catholic and a Protestant understanding of the nature of God and even a Jewish one is that Elohim is a title that is like the president and Yahweh is the name of God, Yehovah, Yahweh. Uh, and so, so that's how we delineate the two differences uh, of the names. Uh, Joseph, via revelation or ingenuity, uh, genius, however you want to approach this subject from a supernatural or a naturalistic perspective, literally just uh, just turns everything on its head um, and comes with his idea of uh, 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 multiple gods through the idea that the, the the word Elohim is a plural, and then says, "Well, hey, we got this name, and now we got." another name and so now he says oh he attaches uh jesus to yahweh this is so foreign <laughs> to conventional christianity <laughs> and it's audacity of of being that 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 mormonism establishes these kind of things um it's fascinating to me now these are the beliefs primarily of the church of jesus christ latter-day saints but there are many many fundamentalist based uh utah mormons uh who are you know polygamists or you know fundamentalists who also would certainly probably be more embracing of these doctrines than than even a, a lot of people in the lds church so it's just really fascinating to see like the utah form of mormonism how it really glommed on to a lot of these ideas and then ran with them and it's just fascinating just to see that as an outsider to see the development of, the, of these uh these doctrines that are uh, very, un, uh, in many ways, very original, uh, and 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 again, it just says something to about Joseph Smith and the uh, the uh, the orig uh, religious imagination, uh, the ability to just take ideas and 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 then see where they go. I'm just kind of ranting a little bit, but I find it it's just so fascinating, isn't no, it? No, no, I I I know where you're coming from, and and you know one of the explanations of that is. The, the LDS theology draws more from the Old Testament than the average Christian church these days does. And it, it plays up doctrine from the Old Testament more, emphasizes it more, and, and ties it in to, to the bigger picture more than you would find in a typical modern uh, Christian Christian church. And that's something I find interesting about it. You know, it, 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 it tries to explain the entire picture, not just the New Testament picture, but also uh, everything that happened before Christ came uh, physically to the earth. You know, it's fascinating so, uh, because what we, we yeah. see the same engagement within the context of the Book of Mormon as well, where we literally have Christians and followers of Christ, who, churches and everything before Christ even comes to earth, right? It, it, before he's even born, we already have a Christian community established in the old world. And then we have yeah. ideas taken from the Old Testament. Jesus is throughout the Old Testament Hebrew narrative as well. Now, uh, many Christians believe that there are pre-incarnate um, possibilities of Christ in the Old Testament. Um, and so some think like in Nebuchadnezzar's uh, fiery, uh, you know, it, it went with the story with the, you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that perhaps Jesus was in there. We also have another example of maybe Mel Melchizedek, uh, the king of Salem uh, with his priesthood um, could possibly be a pre-existent uh, or a pre-incarnate Christ. So th these ideas are there, but you know, that, 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 that Christians have thought about in the past, but man, Joseph Smith just went in, in, in whether it's through revelation or whatever, Jesus is saturates the old, the Hebrew period in a way that no other Christian or Protestant could possibly imagine. Yeah. yeah and, it, and it fundamentally changes the way you look at the entire Bible. Mm -hmm. And and the implications of of what's happening in the Old Testament, uh, yeah. And it's it's it again. It's bold. It's um. It's 
it's laudatory that he, that he would take these positions and develop them to the extent that he did and whether they're true or not it, you know at least he at least he did it and and a lot of it you know uh one thing i like and i'm not going to get into my own personal belief system because it doesn't matter but one thing that i really do believe and i know that not everybody agrees with me is that there is a a an internal logic to the doctrine which i find pretty incredible considering how detailed it is you know um and it's something it was one of the takeaways from writing the book you know it was the first time i ever really delved deeply into the doctrine from every perspective and it all fit together amazingly you know i don't i don't find a lot of internal inconsistencies within within the doctrine which is something that either you know of course if you're a believer you would say that points to that that it was inspired or at the very least joseph smith was uh was brilliant mm -hmm. and of course maybe some of it has been tweaked o over the years which made it more internally consistent but even before the tweaks m most of this stuff fit together mm -hmm. in a, in a in a in a big in a big puzzle and you know it's and it's a lot of it's a lot of pieces um but that's a that's a tangent so a couple more things um Christ, you know, and again, we've talked about the plan of salvation and the fact that each of us can potentially become a God, which again, to me, makes sense if, if, if any of it is true, you know, the meaning of life would be that you can continue to progress. And the implication of that is that you can become a God and you can create worlds. And in the case of our God, number one, he's only our God. He's not the only God from a Mormon perspective, but in his case, he created many, many worlds, innumerable. And so where does Christ, what, what role does Christ play there? And the role that Christ plays there is that um, he's the redeemer of all of these worlds. Mm. You know, this one Christ, our, our Christ is the redeemer of all of God's worlds even though he physically came only to our world. So he was only born in a physical manifestation, in a physical form one time on our earth. Probably, I mean, it's in the books, you know, people would argue that because this earth is the most wicked mm. of all of God's creations. And there's a quote in there, just as Christ is the redeemer of this world, he is also the redeemer of all the worlds he has created and will yet create. This is simple logic. Every world needs a redeemer. And so he's not only the redeemer of this world, but of, of innumerable other, other worlds. And Russell M. Nielsen said, uh, the mercy of the atonement extends not only to an infinite number of people, but also to an infinite number of worlds created by Christ. That's a quote from Russell M. Nelson. That's very interesting stuff. You know, it's fascinating <laughs> because I, you know, as an outsider, I do recognize this is different. And I almost want to say, you know, people, you've probably seen the God Makers cartoon, and they talk about Mormon Jesus, you know, Mormon Jesus. And it's kind of funny. It's just like this thing. And in one sense, I'm going to probably put Mormon Jesus in the title on this because it is different. We have to admit, but within the context of the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints, Joseph Smith was it felt that there needed to be a restoration of truths that were maybe lost in scriptures, uh, that, that maybe things have been corrupted, so that maybe the, the Christian Bible is incomplete and Christian doctrine is based on, or creeds are based on doctrines of man. So in one sense, Joseph felt like the restoration included bringing in these radical ideas that in many sense he believes were true doctrines that were taught that but were lost and so that was part of the point of what he feels what the restoration was all about was restoration of all things including the restoration of what he thought was the original doctrines that were taught yeah yeah and and that's the argument it's it, it's not new it's just a restoration of what was what was there all along and then lost and adam passed and... this along to the patriarch adam went and preached this gospel if you will 
Yeah, yeah. The gospel has has been around, you know, far before this earth. You know, the plan of salvation has existed e eternally long before this earth was created. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to point out, which is a difference in the, you know, um, in the Mormon perspective, and it's related to what we just talked about. Um, he is simply, you know, given the fact that there are innumerable gods and our God is, is our God. And so from that perspective, we are, or Mormons are monotheistic. Um, they would argue, well, we, we have one God. That which means we're not polytheistic. Um, so Christ is simply one of many Christ figures throughout the cosmos, which mm -hmm. is again, which is logical. Mm -hmm. You know, if if there's a bunch of people that have let's 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 say have graduated from the school of of eternal progression, and they've uh, you know they've achieved godhood and they're creating worlds those worlds need a need a redeemer they need a christ figure and it's somebody else it's 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 their christ figure not ours so it's it's <laughs> i mean this is again this is you can imagine how much fun it is you know this is why you have such a such a good time on on this channel you take these ideas and you you extrapolate and you keep and you keep going, OK, well, what then and what then? And and finally, you, you reach, a, in my opinion, the, the correct conclusion hmm. that a lot of people simply haven't thought too much about. And and therefore, they, they you know, they watch the, the channel or they read the book. You know, it's so fascinating because a lot of people uh, who are members of Church of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints often don't engage these ideas and they're told, well, this is deep Mormon doctrine uh you know stick with the milk the the, the meat later uh put this you know all these things that you and i my and the, my thing is it's all it's all been put out there joseph smith put it all out there bring him young put it all out there this is what we believe this is what makes us different than anybody else and this is what makes the church of jesus christ of latter-day saints one of the most unique institutions on this planet uh a peculiar people uh pecu different ideas and it's all out there so it's there for us to engage even as outsiders, even as evangelicals. And that's the thing. I want to hear comments from people who are members of the Church of Jesus Christ, the Latter-day Saints, to get your feedback on this. But I also want to hear from evangelicals. What do you think about the Jesus that's presented, uh, historically speaking, within the context of, of the teachings of the church that were, uh, what do you think? Is Some people would say this is a different Jesus. Uh, I don't like to go there, but I, I do think that it, it's worth a question that's worth pondering. No, no, and you and you you triggered a few really important ideas in my mind. Um, number one, it is out there. You know, this is one. This is one of the amazing things is that a lot of this doctrine that you know I, I back up everything I say in the book with with core core sources, mm -hmm. and most of it is um, the the Mormon canon, specifically the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price, and I have to. I have to confess, I don't know if I had ever read the Pearl of Great Price before I started researching this book, and um, and if I had, I it had been a long time. And I think many, many LDS members have not read the Pearl of Great Price, and there's a lot of deep, you know, deep doctrine in there, but it's it's right there in front of you, and that that that, that that's one thing that really surprised me. And um, and then another thing that that you got me thinking about is how um, how different the attitude of the early church was toward this what what we what we now call fringe or or obscure or you know doctrine they were much more willing to talk about it much less nervous about how how odd it sounded you know that it, indeed proud of of the fact that they were coming up or or having revealed to them you know if it's the doctrine it's the doctrine it's nothing to be ashamed of it's nothing to, to shy away from it's something to be proud of if it's the doctrine why sh why shy away from it and um one you know one thing i say in the introduction to the book is one of my target audiences 
it obviously is devout LDS members because this is one, you know, the, I'm, the, the book can help you, uh, help you understand what it means to be a member of the church. Mm. You know, if you're a member of the church, you probably want to know what it really means, you know, what do, doctrinally. And uh, why not, you know, why, why not, why not delve into some of these deeper issues? I think they're fascinating. And right. if it's the truth, it's the truth. Why, you know, why, why be ashamed of it? Well, as usual, it's always great talking with you, Chris. You're always bringing up interesting topics. I love it because I don't know what's coming and it helps me kind of stay <laughs> sharp and think on my feet. Um, I enjoy this kind of stuff. I think it's really awesome. Again, it's Obscure Mormon Doctrine. I'm going to leave links in the description for those of you who'd like to purchase. Speaking of links in the description, if you'd like to financially support the channel, you can. there will be links on PayPal as well as Patreon, as well as my merch store, mormonbookreviews.com. You can get coffee mugs and all sorts of wonderful merch and everything like that. Um, so, Chris, thanks for coming on the show today. Um, I, I, I assume you mean decaf coffee mugs, right? Well, or hot chocolate mugs. Hot chocolate, <laughs> hot chocolate mugs. There we go. There we go. All right, Stephen. Good. Looking forward to the next one. Thank okay, you. folks. So thanks again for joining us, folks. Leave comments. I want to hear. We got we generated a lot of conversation last week with our episode on polygamy, and I love hearing uh, your perspectives on this. Please share it with us. And just remember, folks, the most important thing is all the voices of the restoration will be heard here on Mormon Book Reviews.